Uh, lots of folks on our, on our hearts, on our prayers. Uh, been asked a couple of different times about Al and Gail. Uh, they're down in Florida, asked how they've fared through everything, and the answer is they fared just fine. Uh, matter of fact, I'm working with uh, them, and hopefully here in the next week or so, there is a Baptist Conference Center not too far from where they are that said they had over 100 trees down. Uh, I'm going to be trying to get together with several other churches in our association to send down some folks who uh, would be willing to do some chainsaw work. And in case you're wondering, well, I can't run a chainsaw. Uh, for every person running a chainsaw, you need about three other people to be clearing brush, pulling things away. So uh, ladies, gentlemen, whoever would like to go, uh, we'll have a set number that we can take. Uh, but they said they will put us up in cabins uh, so that all we have to do is come and take care of our own food uh, and be willing to help do some work. So we'll be hearing more about that here in the com about another week or so. Uh, pray for our team as they are headed uh, to Pennsylvania. Others that are on our hearts, uh, some of which we've told, some of which we haven't, uh, some of which we'll never tell in anyone, uh, but God knows. So uh, please come as we join together in this time of offering. Lift up your request to a God that loves us. Let's join together in prayer. Father God, we thank you this morning for that such a beautiful day to come to worship you and God to be with our brothers and sisters, God, as we sing praises to you. God, we just pray that everything that we say and do here today, God, will just glorify your son's name. God, we know you're still in control, even, God, with all the storms and the trials that we're facing. But, God, we also know that you love each and every one of us, God, and your desire is, God, for us to be protected. And, God, we just praise you this morning, God, for your protection. God, for those that were, went through the storm, God, that came out. God, for those that are facing surgeries and those that have already come through surgery, God, we see your hand upon them. God, we thank you for that. God, we just thank you for this church. God, we just ask you now, God, to bless this offering. God, may it further the kingdom of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray this morning. Amen. Verses 16 and 17. All right. So, okay. If you, uh, okay, you're already standing. <laughs> uh, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped and for every good work. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that you give, for your love for us. I pray that as we spend time in it today, that you will guide our thoughts words, our actions. God, may we focus on you, on your ability to change lives, and we'll give you glory for that. Bless us now through this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Began this series of the God questions last week, uh, looking at the question, is God real? How do we know there even is a God? This week we turn our attention a little bit to uh, the Word of God. Uh, we understand it. We'll use uh, all sorts of nice big words. We'll call it infallible. Uh, we'll call it uh, that it is inerrant. But what do all those things mean? Just to be honest with you, there are a lot of nice big words that describe one simple thing. We believe that the Bible, that this is God's word to us, not man's word about God. That it is given by Him, not written by us. Now, we'll break down some of what all of that means, but uh, what I'm not going to be getting into this morning, I will be getting into, hopefully, this evening. Uh, we will once again, as we have in the past, uh, have time for questions, uh, and those questions don't have to be what we're talking about today. Uh, somebody already prepped me with one that was going to be coming up tonight, and uh, welcome to that, and I'll do my best to fumble through the answer to that question. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at tonight as the study part is where did this thing come from? How did we put together this collection of stuff that we call the Bible? Written over some 1,500 years, how is it that what we came to have is the Bible? Why is some stuff not in there? Why are the ones that we have in there included? So we'll be spending time looking tonight at where did our Bible come from? I've been asked several times uh, over the course of my tenure here, uh, would you teach on where the Bible came from? Well, tonight we'll give that a whirl, so I hope you'll come and be a part of that. 
But when we begin talking about Scripture, talking about what good is it, passage that is easiest to come to is this one here in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, or as uh, Micah read out of the NIV, actually a very good trans, uh, wording of what is there, it is God-breathed. God gave it, but what does that look like? It says it's given by inspiration of God and is profitable, meaning it does some level of good. What does it do good for? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What does this mean when we unpack it? There are other passages we could look at that are equally uh, as important. It says, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword out of the book of Hebrews. Lots of things describe what it means, but when we get down to the core, the basic of it, what does it mean that Scripture is God-breathed? Or what does it mean that it's given by, I use the New King James, given by inspiration of God? And it is this, we believe in what I will call and what scholars call the plenary verbal concept of inspiration. Now that sounds like a great, strange worded thing that sounds about as good as infallible and inerrant. But what we mean by the concept of plenary verbal is this. God breathed, God inspired the authors. For instance, this is the book that we're reading out of today uh, called 2 Timothy. Who wrote 2 Timothy? Well, you can give the Sunday school answer. Remember last week we talked about what the Sunday school answer to anything is? Jesus. Okay, you know, we can give the Sunday school answer, but the reality is the person who put pen to paper was Paul. Paul wrote the book of 2 Timothy. Well, did Paul just decide that one day he's going to get together and I've got some thoughts about some things and let me write down my thoughts. And we don't believe that's what happened with Scripture. We believe that God worked through Paul, worked through Paul's life, worked through Paul's circumstances, experiences, all the things that Paul knew, all the things that Paul understood, all of his education, but yet it was God who said, this is what you're going to write. And it's not as if there was God dictating it. It's not like Paul was sitting there saying, okay, God, what's the next word you have for me? But, okay, God, we'll write the word but. God worked through him so that it was the author of Paul, as God was directing, as God was inspiring, we're familiar with the term uh, for somebody to be inspired, we're familiar with that outside of a church context. You've got a football coach who comes out there and before the team is about to go out, come on guys, we can get them, we can go to them, and he tries to inspire the people. Uh, think of the general before the big war as he comes out there and gives the big speech about how this is the day that we're going to conquer. You have the ladies at the scrapbook function as they, ladies, we're going to put together 15 scrapbook pages today, whatever it is, whatever your picture of how that's supposed to look. You get the general idea of inspiration. God said, this is what needs to be said. Paul, this is what you're going to direct. And Paul wrote down, as God would lead, as God would direct, and wrote down this passage here. Well, then he did the same thing for David. He did the same thing for Moses. He did the same thing for uh, Isaiah. He did the same thing for the prophets. He did the same thing through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of these different things, God gave them the inspiration. God pushed them towards what needed to be done and made sure that it was his will that was accomplished through it. But yet he used them to write it. So God used man to write it. God directed it, what we call uh, the plenary verbal, not dictation, but God used through them to write the Word. Now, what does all of this look like? Well, if you're familiar with this Bible, uh, this one, uh, nice. Uh, my wife gets this. I actually have three other versions of this exact same Bible. This is my preaching Bible. Uh, it doesn't have a bunch of notes. Uh, I know some of you are um, very fond of, Steve, uh, the study Bible that uh, so-and-so wrote underneath it, and this is all of their words that they wrote about what God said. That There's a place for a study Bible. This isn't it. I like something thin, nice. Uh, it's a leather backing, uh, Holy Bible, New King James Version, uh, lots of spaces. If you look at all of my Bibles, there will be little dark spots where I hold my place with my finger, and eventually it just gets dark in between there. I enjoy the Bible, but what is it? Well, there are 66 different components of it, beginning in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, going all the way into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's made up of 66 books. Some of them are very long, like the book of Psalms. 
Some of them are very short, like the book of Jude. Some of them contain a lot of different teaching. Some of them are just written for a very specific point to a very specific audience to, to bring about a specific level of change. Paul wrote the book of Philemon, very short book. It was written to a fellow who owned a slave who had run away, and he was telling him, he said, things have changed in life. We need to address the way this is happening for you. And so it's addressed to a specific person for a specific purpose. But there are always applications that we can make. When I spent time in seminary, one of the things that we talked about as we began looking at what God's Word is, there is one way to understand and interpret Scripture. It only had one original intent for one original author. God wrote it for a specific reason. Now, as best we can when we come to these 66 books, we read that and say, what did it mean? The book of Philemon was written by Paul to Philemon for a specific purpose. What did it mean as Philemon picked up this letter, not in a book like this, but often probably in a scroll, and he picked it up and he read it? What did it mean to him? And there was one interpretation. But there are nearly limitless applications. Limitless applications. Because this same word of God that meant something to Philemon back then meant something 500 years ago as the Protestant Reformation was getting underway. And it means something today. Now, it meant something different in application to Philemon than it did in the Middle Ages than it, than it did for us today. If we're sitting here reading a thing and we're talking about uh, Jesus' statement at the Sermon on the Mount, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus says, but I want to tell you, if you look on a woman to lust after her, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Now, in 2017, we may look at that passage in an application and say, you know what, when you cut on your computer... You need to be careful what you look at. When you're driving down the road and the billboards that are there that are showing a really lusty woman who if you drink this, this type of bourbon, you're going to be able to get a woman just like her. Okay, you, know, you need to be careful what you look at. 500 years ago, that same application was not true. They did not ride their horse and buggy up and down the road and look at billboards. A thousand years ago, they didn't have to worry about looking at their smartphone and what was going to be on it. Different applications. Same truth. Be careful what your eyes are looking at. But a lot of different applications that we need, that we need to understand. So when we begin looking at the, at the Bible, we have some 40 different authors, 66 different books, written over three continents and 1,500 years. How is it that we know by the time you put all of that stuff together, how is it that we know that the Bible is reliable? Is this thing really true? People have looked at it. People have dissected it. People have tried to pull it apart, uh, look at different things. Well, what about this inconsistency? What about this thing that's a problem in Scripture? And they begin looking at it and trying to pull it apart. But folks, I'm going to tell you, what we have as this Bible here, and we'll look at it more tonight, is in basically the exact same form that we had at 1,900 years ago. And it still has the same ability as it did then, to change lives today. And we look at the whole of Scripture and say, what is the purpose of this thing? The purpose of it is not just to give some good ideas on some neat things and, oh yeah, we see a little bit of history here and there. The purpose of this book is to very simply draw us into relationship with God. Show me how I'm supposed to live. One of the people you love in acronyms, one of the favorite ones I've seen for Bible says, basic instructions before leaving earth. What is it that my life is supposed to look like? What is it that's coming up afterward? And we'll begin looking at some of those things as we break it down, to, break it down tonight. But I want us to examine just a couple of different things. How do we understand what Scripture is? And the beautiful thing about Scripture is, one of the things we can look at and say, is this thing reliable? Is it true? Is you go back and say, well, what did it say? And then has it come true? The Old Testament, especially in the place where we call the prophets, dealt so much with, ironically enough, prophecy. Promises of what was going to happen. And we can look at it and say, did this prophecy that was given 500 years before it was completed, did it actually come true? 
So let's look at a couple of them that Scripture gives. Say, you know what? Is the Scripture reliable? How do we know if it's really true? And we're going to look at a couple of things in the Old Testament and look at how they're fulfilled in the New Testament. The ones we'll look at are specifically in relationship to Christ. The Scripture says He was going to be born in Bethlehem. Back in the Old Testament, the prophecy is in Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. So that you don't have to continue bouncing back and forth, uh, the passages are up there behind me. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, even from everlasting. There was a promise that this little town of Bethlehem, which just to be honest with you, was a nothing place. Bethlehem was basically like saying, the next president of the United States is going to come from Penrose. Hogtown. Okay? Hogtown is going to be the birthplace. And it says that 500 years previous. 500 years from now, this great... Um, president who's going to help lead our nation is going to come out of this little city that nobody's really ever paid much attention to. That's the picture of what Scripture says. Did it come true? Yes. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, 500 years previous there's a promise it's going to come out of Bethlehem. Now if he'd have come out of any place else, then that prophecy is not true. And if that prophecy is not true, how is it that I can trust the rest of it? Scripture is perfect in its fulfillment. The second one, the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. Genesis chapter 49, verse number 10 says this, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. This was a promise given all the way back in the book of Genesis. If you remember going back, Abraham didn't have a kid. God ended up blessing him with Isaac. Isaac had, had two sons, Jacob and Esau. The younger one, Jacob, was the one who received the blessing. His name was later changed to Israel, where we get Israelites, everything else, going back to Abraham's grandson. He had 12 boys, which we call the 12 tribes of Israel. And there was one of them that was going to be the lead of that, and that was Judah. So all the way back 1,500 years before the, tri- before the time of Christ, there was the promise that out of this tribe of Judah was going to come up this one who was going to be the promised Messiah. And he's going to be the one that's going to rule forever. So understanding that promise then, you're able to go back all the way through Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter, th- uh, Luke chapter 3 as they begin talking about all of these genealogies and how things came about and where things came. And even the wise men as they were looking knew this guy was going to come out of Judah. So they're sitting there scouring all of these things. And Scripture for 1,500 years previous said, this, you want to start looking for where that Messiah is going to come. You know what? Uh, uh, Zebulun may have been a great kid. It's not coming through him. Levi was a pretty good youngin, but it's not going through him. One out of this 12, here's where you start looking for that line where that Messiah is going to come. And even as we looked at this last one, out of you, Bethlehem, which is in the land of Judah, going to come this one who's going to be born the Messiah. Promise of this Messiah, 1,500 years before, showing where he was going to come. Now, as Jesus was about to go into Jerusalem to be uh, be crucified, if you're thinking about a guy going to be crucified, and he's being marched into town, how is he going to go into town? Guy that's going to be crucified, generally considered, not going to be heralded as a great king, as a great man. As he goes into town, probably going to be in shackles, probably going to be beaten, probably going to be scourged. How did Jesus go into town as he was heading to Jerusalem? Scripture says he was praised. He's going to be riding on a colt, coming in as the conquering Messiah. Now, who would have thought then that you come in with people crying out, Hallelujah, that everything's going beautiful, and now all of a sudden, here in just a little while, one week later from being hailed as the Messiah, he's going to be crucified. Two things are radically inconsistent except for the fact that the Old Testament prophesied that was what it was going to look like, and it came true. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, there's the prophecy 
that this Messiah was going to come in riding on a colt. And it says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That given the promise, all the way back in the book of Zechariah, this is going to happen. Zechariah, one of the later prophets written some 400 or so years prior to the time of Christ, talks about this Messiah coming in Jerusalem, riding on a colt. Did it happen that way? Luke chapter 19 Verses 35 through 37, it says, Then they brought him to Jesus, him being the colt. And they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. And there went Jesus riding into Jerusalem, soon to be crucified, but at this point hailed as the king. What else? Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah chapter 11, verse number 12, says, Then I said to him, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now what was this in prophecy to? This was in prophecy to this Messiah was going to be sold. I'm bringing you somebody. Give me my wages for bringing you this slave. And what was the weight going to be? 30 pieces of silver. Is that what happened? If you remember, as Jesus was being betrayed, Jesus has gone to the high priest and said, you know what, you're looking for Jesus. I'll give him to you, but there's going to be a price for it. And you know what the price was? The same 30 pieces of silver. Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 and 15. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Scripture is true over and over and over again. The promises made 500, 1500 years prior, now coming up to the time of Christ, are held true to the letter. Are there others? Did I just pick out the four instances in the entirety of Scripture that happened to work out right? Messiah would be spit upon, beaten, scourged. Messiah would be wounded by his enemies. The Messiah would have his hands and feet pierced. The Messiah would be crucified with thieves. All of these things, pictures just of what Jesus Christ was going to be. Forget the ones that we talk about in the Old Testament where it says that uh, God was going to bring judgment on this group and he was going to bring it by this group. And this group was going to try to get together with this group, but then the problems would come. And people look at it and say, how in the world can you say that over the course of 1,500 years, every time God made a promise, it came true? What does that say to me? It says to me, I can trust this thing. If it's going to be true in the little, bit, little bitty details, I'm quite confident it can be something that I can trust in for the bigger areas of life. What are those bigger areas of life? Well, Scripture also tells me that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after death, judgment. It tells me that one day, when all of us die, we're going to have to face our king. We're going to have to face that final judge. It tells us that there's only one way to, to pass that final test. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know what? I can trust, I can look back, I can measure all of these different things and say, you know what? It was true here, 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 and here. I can't find one that hasn't, that's been prophesied that hasn't come true unless it's a prophecy about what's going to happen at the very end. And it just hadn't had opportunity to come true yet. Everything else in Scripture I can point to and say, this is accurate, this is accurate, this is accurate. And guess what? If God is accurate with those little things, I'm quite confident that when he tells me I'm a sinner, I can look at it and agree with it. When he tells me that my destiny is separated from God, I can look at it and believe it. But when he tells me there's one means of salvation, I can look at it and trust it too and place my faith in God because I know about it out of a very reliable, truthful word. Well, then how in the world do we know this thing is worth anything? How do we know that what we have here isn't what some dude in the Middle Ages decided? Nah, I don't like that, so I'm going to change all of this. I don't like the way that book of Hebrews writes, so I'm going to reword some of it. Old Testament, Isaiah, you know, Isaiah was weird. You know, but you want to talk about weird. Let's get into Ezekiel where he's talking about this wheel spinning within a wheel and these visions of dead bones rising up. How in the world do we know that all of that stuff is true? In 1947, there was a young man who was a goat herder. And he lost one of his goats. And there were caves all up in this area, and he took a rock and 
when you throw a rock and hit a goat, it makes a certain sound. I will trust some of you to try to duplicate that sound better than I'm going to, than I'm going to try to do, but you can imagine it's not a pretty one when a goat gets hit with a rock. So he's sitting there throwing rocks into these caves, and he throws one, and he hears the sound of pottery shattering. He goes to investigate, and he gets up there and looks, and it is scrolls upon scrolls upon scrolls of Scripture. The place was Qumran, what we normally refer to these are, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, these Dead Sea Scrolls are kind of interesting because what they are are Old Testament books, and it's parts of every Old Testament book except for the book of Esther. Every Old Testament book except for the book of Esther. And other than problems with spelling here and there, it's amazing. This happened in 1947. It was exactly what we had here that said, this is what Scripture looks like. 600 some odd documents, exact what we have as Scripture, minus some spelling differences. And you wonder, how in the world could a spelling difference happen? Well, that obviously shows things aren't true. This morning, Brennan and I had a nice conversation. He's up there running the PowerPoint and everything, and I had sent him PowerPoint. And he said, Dad, we got a problem with your PowerPoint. I said, we do. He said, yeah, you misspelled a word. I said, I did. And he said, yes, the word prophecy. I had up there P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y. And I said, that's how you spell prophecy. He's like, no, it's not. And he pulled up the little thing on, on Google, because Google's always right. He pulled it up there and said, prophecy, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y. He said, see, you, th this one's wrong. I said, prophecy and prophecy, same thing. Except for as we begin looking at it, I don't know if I can spit it out. <laughs> Brendan, was Bre Brendan was... He was not wrong. There you go. I like that. P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y is the verb form to prophesy about something. Something that is written, the noun form is a prophecy with a C-Y. My son was correct. There you go. Merry Christmas. I love you. Yes, thumbs up. All right. Now, how in the world could you make that mistake? Prophecy and prophesy, same, same concept. S-Y is the verb, C-Y is the noun. I've been studying scripture for 30 some odd years. I messed it up. How in the world can somebody write P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y rather than C-Y? I think you can see it's not really all that hard. So as we're sitting here looking at, is this thing reliable? Guy throws a rock into a cave, finds 600 scrolls that other than little spelling variances are exactly what we have here as Scripture. Kind of hard to say, well, you know, this thing's been changed so many times. Mighty consistent for scrolls having set up someplace for 1,900 years that show Scripture is trustworthy. So then why do we have it? What's the purpose? What is it good for? I believe that Scripture is very practical. I believe that it has some very important things. This passage here in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 lists a few of them. It says it's profitable. How is it profitable? How is it practical to our daily lives? It's profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. Doctrine is that thing that I have to understand and learn. Now, every pastor understands that when you use that word doctrine on a Sunday morning, all of a sudden people switch to saying, man, I wonder, wonder if Carolina is going to win that ball game today. Man, wonder what my wife has fixed for lunch. I wonder if what I've thought about my wife today, if she's even going to fix me lunch. You know? And we'll start sitting here thinking about all the things. Man, what in the world happened to LSU yesterday? You know, and we'll start sitting here thinking about all these different things because pastors use that word doctrine. Doctrine is that boring, horrible, terrible stuff that the Bible tells us all about. And I don't believe so because what doctrine is, what that teaching is, is it helps me understand what I believe the content of our faith 
How do I know who God is? I didn't figure out God on my own. I'm not that big enough. I'm not that smart enough. I'm not that strong enough. How do I understand it? Get it from what? From God's Word. How is it that I understand my condition? Because God's Word. How is it that I understand what's going to happen one day? Because of God's Word. I look at it and it gives me the content. Help me understand what it is that I believe. Why is that important? Because if it's not important for you, it's not going to be important for your kids, it's not going to be important for your grandkids, or so on. And it's amazing what begins to happen as biblical literacy declines. You want to understand what the, the decline of biblical literacy looks like? Begin looking at what's happening in society today. And as we begin looking at life and looking at what's going on, and you can point back to a time where it says, you know what, school kids aren't having enough information. They don't have enough resources in their classrooms. So Congress decides it's going to get together, put up money to purchase 250,000 Bibles to be distributed in the schools. Take that forward to today, and the Gideons who are willing to hand them out for free aren't even allowed to stand in front of a school and pass them out to kids as they leave. What's the difference? We used to know Scripture, we used to value it, and now it's no longer valued. Now it's not even acceptable in the workplace anymore. If you don't believe me, check and see if with your boss if they'll let you keep your Bible sitting there on your desk. And for most places now, no, you can't. Not all, but most. Now you can't even keep your Bible out there in front of people. Why? Because we no longer value it. Because it teaches us who we are. When we lose who God is, when we lose who we are, it's a pretty quick decline to the fact that, you know what, I, I get to reject your reality and insert my own. I reject your morality and insert my own. And what begins to happen is rather than uh, a cohesive understanding of what God has a desire for us, it's what I want and what you want. And we place ourselves in the position of God. Ask that question tonight, John. I'll be happy to answer it. It's not the exact time or place, but bring that question tonight and we'll deal with it. All right? It says it's profitable for doctrine. And then for reproof. What is reproof? It shows me where I'm wrong. It shows me where, the, where these things are that I am in error. Now, nobody today likes to know that they're wrong. Nobody likes to be told that the word that needs to go up on the screen for prophecy is spelled with a C-Y rather than an S-Y. Nobody likes to be told that. Why? Because it hurts our pride a little bit. But guess what? We all have areas where we fall short. Scripture shows those to us. And it's funny. When God shows us our error, God seldom does it with a two-by-four. God often, when he shows us our error, Chris, you know the way that you did such and such yesterday? You need to make that right. How do I know it? Well, because God's word tells me this is what it should have been. You didn't do this. You were in error. It's good for reproof. But then the other part of that, and they're almost like two sides of the same coin, is correction. It's not enough for somebody to say, hey, you're going here, but it's wrong. Okay, what do I do? And I'll point and give a picture of that. I've got a phenomenal stepfather, Steve Farmer. Love the man. Good, godly man loves his family. He was a stepfather, and he never did not come into my life at all until I was in the fourth grade. Didn't come in to be married to my mom until I was in the eighth grade. Prior to that, I had a father who left, abandoned, and tried to have my mother killed. I had a stepfather who, when a sister ended up being my sister ended up diagnosed with cancer. He left because he couldn't handle it. And then it was just me and my mom. Did not have a father until I was in the eighth grade. Scared me to death when my kids came along. 
because all I had was negative examples. Well, I don't want to be the guy who hired a hitman to have Katina killed. Don't want to don't go that route. I don't want to be the guy who had so little care that he abandoned his family. I don't want to be this. And it's hard to navigate life when all you have are the negatives. Okay, I don't want to step here because this is bad. The problem is it leaves everything else. And I wasn't quite sure where to step. I knew one direction, one direction I did not want to go, but it left so much else. If all the Bible was was rebuke, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, you horrible person, where would we go in life? Thankfully, God's Word doesn't, doesn't tell us where not to step. It also shows us what to do. And it's the positive example. There's the statement that says, don't go this way, instead... Go this way. Two sides of the same coin. Rebuke and correction. We think of correction as being taken out to the woodshed, and that's not the intent of it here. It's, you're going, this is the wrong direction, now here's the right direction, go in it. And for the last one, for instruction in righteousness. What does that mean? Righteousness is a great big church word that says, doing what's right. How is it that you live a right life before God and before man? We trust the principles of God's Word. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. To what end result? That the man of God may be perfect. That doesn't mean I never sin. It means I'm complete. I've done what I'm supposed to do. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped, given everything I need, to live my life in a way that's going to honor and please God for every good work. 1,500 years, 40 authors, three continents, 66 books, all for one purpose, to learn who God is, to learn to love Him, and to learn to serve Him. The heart and the core of what Scripture teaches is simple, and it's this. Every single solitary one of us are sinners. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 describes it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does God's Word tell me about me? It says I'm a sinner. It says I've tried it my way and I've come up lacking. But it also tells us that the result of that is death. The wages of sin, what I've earned, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Next week we're going to look to put some of this together. What is this going to look like? Is there really only one way to heaven? When all said and done, isn't me being good enough enough? And if Scripture's reliable, it says no. Quoted John chapter 14, verse 6 earlier. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If God's word is reliable, if it's true, then it tells me I only have one choice. I can go follow Christ. The end of it leads to eternity in heaven. My alternative is to go Chris's way, and the end result is death. Not only what all of us will experience when we die, but eternal separation from God. This morning, can look at the truth of God's Word. Will you believe what it tells you about who you are? Will you believe what it tells you about who He is, what He came to do, and the fact that He loved you so much He gave His life on a cross so that you could experience life abundant and life eternal? Will you place your faith in the God who told us everything we need to know, gave us everything we need, those basic instructions before leaving earth. God, I'll trust you. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you for its ability to change lives. I thank you for the fact that you love us so much that you gave it to us, that you help us to understand who you are, that we don't have to fumble around in the dark and figure it out. But God, you've given us your truth. It has stood the test of time. And God, we look forward to what it's going to continue to teach us, to train us, 
to draw us closer to you step by step. I pray that through this time this morning that if there's one here who doesn't know you, that they've seen who you are, and that, God, that their lives will be submitted to you. Give them the courage, Father, to come and, and make that change. God, for so many of us, we've accepted Christ as Savior, but yet we live as if your word isn't true. Because, God, we continue to do things our own way and say things, do things that we know are 100% contrary to your word, but, God, we still live that way anyways. Give us courage this morning, Father, to repent, to come back to you in a way that's going to bring you glory. Use this time. Speak to our hearts. Give us courage to respond. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If there's a decision you need to make, something you need to do, come down. Pastor Mark and I will be here. We'd love to talk with you, pray with you. Come, pray, whatever you need to do. You'll be obedient as God calls. Please stand with me as we sing. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Hope that you'll come out this evening. I look forward to our time together studying where in the world did we get this thing? How did it end up in the form we have it? Uh, through councils and writers and everything else. We'll look forward to that time tonight. So I uh, hope that you'll come and be a part of that. Pastor Mark, give us what we need. All right. Make sure to bring your questions too uh, as we begin that uh, in-depth look at uh, where the Bible came from this evening at 6 o'clock. And, of course, 7 o'clock on Tuesday evening. You can come to one or both. I assure you they will be different. <laughs> so, uh, And as you're going, I just want to remind ladies, stop by the welcome desk, check out what's going on with the women's ministry. There's much to be involved with, much to plug into, and uh, we'll see you back this evening. Join me in prayer as we leave. God, we thank you again for who you are, uh, for your truth and your word. Uh, God, that you, uh, through your omnipotent hand, through your foreknowledge, for your strength, God, you've allowed us to have access to your word the saving truth and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, I just thank you that, for that uh, truth this morning. And I pray that as we leave here, God, may our hearts and our minds just be drawn to you. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>